Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I'm over here by the piano in case you can't find the voice. It's so good to be with you today. Pastor will introduce me and my wife here in just a minute, but glad to be with you today. The very first day of 2022. Can you believe that? But we're here today, the first Sunday, to worship together. Stand with us, as, if you would, as we begin our worship in music this morning. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing. He gave his everything, cause he gave his everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal. And show the lost ones his love He came to go Prepare a place for us That's why we praise him That's why we sing That's why we offer him our everything That's why we bow down and worship this king Cause he gave his everything Cause he gave What a better way to start an exciting new year that's refreshed than feeling refreshed when you get out of your house. Yet, what was it, yesterday it was like 70, 75 degrees, something like that, and this morning it's in the 20s. Feels like it's in the fours. But it's good, it, it's invigorating, it's exciting, it's a, it, it starts in us a new path, a uh, new time of year, and new excitement is waiting for us. Uh, so we're sitting here going through, trying to figure out music, trying to figure everything else out, and I get two different individuals that tell me, hey, you really need to reach out to this one individual and talk to him and have him come fill in and lead some music for you. So one of the individuals that told me that was Dondi Allison, our flute player, who was at the Baylor game, so she's not here this, this morning because of traveling. But Dondi said, you gotta, I got referred this individual and the other one was Tim Morrow, who works with the BGCT, who a lot of us know. And he said, you got to check this guy out. So I went and had lunch with him and asked Wayne if he would come in and fill in. So this is Wayne Spoontz and his wife, Cindy, who's leading us in worship this morning. And we are so grateful to have you guys with us. Thank you so much for giving of your time to come and lead us as we take our voices to God this morning. Uh, they live close by. They live in Belton. And I have been doing uh, worship music for <clears throat> a few years. 
a few years. We, we've been married 44. So. <laughs> but uh, so he comes with, with a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and uh, a willing and serving heart. So thank you so much for filling out for us this morning. If you will grab your bullets, and if you are new with us, or if you have just prayer requests, and you rip off this little connect card that's attached better than I just did, because there is a perforated section. But if you will tear that off, fill out your name, uh, the contact information, drop this in the offering plate as it passes by. I'd love to reach out to you guys, and thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, there is a section on the back that you can write out any kind of prayer request. Fold that sucker in half, drop it in the offering plate. Uh, the staff and I will pray over those uh, this week. If it is a confidential prayer that you only want certain, you are more than welcome to slip that to me following the service, and I will keep that uh, confidential. But make sure you get that sucker filled out. We've got a lot of things in the bulletin, a lot of things coming up. We'll talk more about that towards the end of the service. But let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for another year. God, you provide so many opportunities for us to minister to your kingdom, to your children, God, glorifying you every step of the way. You've called us to be on mission. You've called us to be out and doing things in this world, in this hurting and broken world, God. And just the opportunity to be able to come together with our brothers and our sisters, to be able to come together in a time of worship, of praising you. God, we just pray that uh, this morning all the distractions that are in our heads or in our hearts, that they just be wiped away. And we, we focus on you, God. We just came out of the Christmas season. We just came out of 2021, a stressful year. And we've got excitement coming ahead. And God, it's all because of you that that has happened. And we just, um, we just praise you this morning and all that you do in our lives. Be with us. Speak to us this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we just stand before you this morning with humble hearts, Lord. We just pray this morning that each one of us that are gathered here today as your children, Lord, that we draw close to you. We draw close to one another. Lord, that uh, you'd uh, lift us up as we hear Brother Mark's sermon today. Lord, that you'd give him the words to say. Lord, as we come here today and worship you, Lord, that we'd share our income, Lord, we give our gift and offerings, Lord, and love and for one another. Lord, we just ask you to bless this uh, sermon in today that he gives that lost souls would be saved. There's one here that don't know you, Lord, that they'd come down and they wouldn't be able to leave. Then, Lord, that people would open their hearts to you today and be saved. And we ask these things, Lord, in your precious holy name of Jesus. Amen. A simple offering is all that we bring. We give our lives, claim you as king. We are your servants and before you we bow. With every breath we make this vow. We were led to worship, give you praise. With all our hearts, with all our days, Father, we want to do what you've created us to. We will live to worship you. Our every moment is a gift of your grace. We all are yours now and always. More than just words, O oh Lord, the cry of our hearts is to let our lives speak of how great you are. We will live to worship, give you praise with all our hearts, with all Father, we want to do what you've created us to. We will live to worship you. Because you are holy, you are worthy. You alone are deserving. You are holy. y'all miss christy is out there on the other side of those doors ready to take you guys back i, I kind of envy them a little bit she's a good teacher the um uh, good morning so i love it say it again morning. morning there you go there you go i love the excitement in the air but i got a question for you how many of y'all when you were kids played the game 20 questions 
20 questions. Did I hear somebody say, I wish I could forget the, that game? Is that what I heard? It, it was a fun game, but it got a little annoying sometimes. And the whole purpose behind the game was a mental exercise. It was a way where somebody would come up with an object or a person, and then everybody else had to guess by asking a series of questions what that person was guessing. 20 questions. A game that was a mental exercise to help us grow, help us to analyze certain things. And questions are a good thing to have because without them, we cannot grow. Without of them, we, we can't understand who we are. We can't understand what we truly have inside of our hearts or inside of our minds. And questions sometimes can be good, sometimes they can be bad, and sometimes they can be necessary. But questions are an important thing regardless. If you look throughout Scripture, one of the things that you'll find is that Jesus is asked roughly around 183 questions, but he only ever gives a direct answer to three. The rest of them, he turns around and he asks a question in return. Why? Why does he ask questions in return? He wants us to analyze. He wants us to think through. He wants us to be able to come up with answers for ourselves based on the wisdom that he has given us. So he asks questions in return. And you start to see that unfold in passages of how it makes the people think and realize. And so they answer and he says, yes, you are correct. But it's that question that helps us think through things. It's that question that starts off. And this morning, I'm going to start us off with a question. What brought you here this morning? Think through that one for just a second. What brought you here? Why are you here in these pews? Why are you online? What is it that brought you here to First Baptist this morning? Now, don't get me wrong. I love seeing all your faces. I love seeing you guys online. I love the fact that you're here. But what brought you here? What was the reason? What, got, what made you come through those doors this morning? Was it a routine? Was it something that every single week you know, hey, I got to go to First Baptist, I got to go to church, I got to go there and lift my voices up? Was it something that you've always done all of your life, and so it's just a habit? Or did somebody drag you along? Some of you guys are probably thinking, I'm here because my wife made me come. I wanted to sleep in, I wanted to go deer hunting, I wanted to do something, but she made me come. And that may be in your situation. I don't know. But why are you here? What is the reason you came this morning? I want our minds to be challenged. I want them to expand. I want them to push past our normal, comfortable existence. Because it is very easy to get into a routine. It's very easy to get into a rut. It's very easy to say, you know what? It's what we've always done, so it's what we have to do. It's very easy to lose focus of why we're here. And we start to think of church as something other than what it actually is. Because we don't have our focus there. Some of you may be thinking, hey, why am I here? That's an easy question. Okay, so let me pose the other question. What is church? What is the church? Why does the church exist? What is church? There was something that many of us did as kids. We've even done it with our own kids or grandkids, and I'm going to ask everybody to indulge me just a little bit. It's not going to hurt. I promise you that. But what I want you to do is I want to take everybody do your hands like this. If you're online, do the same thing. Do your hands like this. And if you were in the deacon meeting this morning, you saw Doc do this. So I know you know what I'm talking about. So do your hands like this, and I want you to interlock your fingers. Okay, now here in a second, you're going to be doing this. But not, and we ain't there yet. So interlock your fingers. Okay, now if you know what I'm saying, so repeat, repeat with me. Here's the church. Oh, I can't hear you. Come on. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open it up. And here's all the people. The sad thing is, that's exactly how many people think about church. They go, here's the church. Here's the steeple. There's the people. The people are the church. What we really should be saying is, here's the building. Here's a roof. There's the church. Because we are the church. The church is not a building. It's not a location that we come to once a week, twice a week, for an hour or so at a time. We, you, me, we are the church. The church is the people of God 
living out the mission of God for the glory of God. Let me say that again. The church is the people of God living out the mission of God for the glory of God. The early Christian churches didn't have a building, or at least not what we would think of as a building. They would meet in homes. They would meet in secret a lot of times because they were facing persecution. They would meet in open air areas. Some of the biggest, uh, most famous sermons that we hear about or read about, some of the most famous theologians, Charles Spurgeon to name one, several of them met in open airs. They gathered crowds wherever they could. They didn't have a building to go sit in. What would happen if we wake up tomorrow morning and realize that the church got burned down? The building itself. What would happen if tomorrow morning we wake up and we realize a tornado has come through and damaged part of the church building? In Rockport, Texas, not that long ago, Hurricane Harvey came through and it destroyed the sanctuary for the First Baptist Church down in Rockport. You know what they did? They put a big tarp over the building and went out and met underneath an oak tree that was close on their property, and then they went and served the community. Why? Because they realized the church was not the building. If the building falls, we're still gonna have church. Why? Because we are the church. We gather together. We praise his name. We lift our voices up. God has created us to be the church. This morning, we're gonna kick off a new series called Embracing the Change. The church building is not the church. It facilitates the actions of the church. It gives us a place to gather. It gives us a place to sing. It gives us a place to praise God. It gives us a place to invite people to to be able to hear the message. It doesn't fulfill it. It facilitates it. Embracing the change. Starting next week, we're going to walk through the book of Acts, which is all about the church who the church is called to be, how we're supposed to be in the world that we're living, in this broken and hurting world. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy, and some of y'all might be thinking, no, 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 I've been taught my whole life that the church is the four walls. The church is the building that I come to. We even talk about, hey, I'm going to go to service at so-and-so church, or I'm going to go to a wedding at this church down here. And there is a sense in which the church is referred to as the building. That's accurate. But... It's not who the church is. It's the building. There was a recent poll conducted by Gallup in which 80% of the respondents that were surveyed said, I have a relationship, excuse me, I have a relationship with Jesus, but don't want anything to do with the church. I have a relationship with Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church. And the reason for that, the sad reality, the bitter reality, is that the church is not in a good light. And when I think of, when I'm saying that, I'm talking about universally, the church itself is not seen in a good light. The church, by many people, the reason why they have a relationship with Jesus, but they don't go to church, is because the church is negative. The church is judgmental. The church is hypocritical. The church is all, there's a laundry list of things that they work their way through. Why? Why? Because that's how the people of the church are representing. That's how we're representing it. We focus on things that aren't really that important. The passage we're going to talk about this morning points where our focus should be. The reason why people don't go to a church is because they see, and churches have split over these things. The pews, the colors of the carpet, the colors on the wall, the music styles, all these various things. We can have our preferences, absolutely. We can even voice our preferences, absolutely. But when it comes right down to it, is the color on the wall what saved us? No. It's Jesus Christ. It's him coming and being born and dying and being resurrected. Our salvation is through Christ, not on these other things that we focus on. Nowhere in the entirety of Scripture will you read a phrase, let's go to church. It doesn't exist. It's not there. Because when Jesus said, I will build my church, he was not talking about brick and mortar. He was not talking about a paint can and a paintbrush. He was talking about the people. 
He was talking about the people. But for, for us to be able to even begin to understand that concept, we have to answer one very important question. See, there's that word again, question. We have to understand one very important question. Who is Jesus? If we're going to understand that Jesus built his church, we have to understand who Jesus is. That way we can understand where it's coming from. Do me a favor, open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew. And we're going to put it up on the screen here in a few minutes. But the book of Matthew found, and we're going to be in chapter 16. But the book of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. And lays out the narrative of Jesus' life and his teachings. And by the time we come to chapter 16, he's been traveling with his disciples. He's taught them a lot of things. He's healed a lot of people. He's performed various miracles. Basically, his reputation, his fame is being spread. People are learning who this guy is. They're understanding to some degree who Jesus is. And Jesus knew something was coming. He knew he was facing the cross. He knew that he was not going to be right there. And so he's teaching his disciples what they're going to encounter. And he's preparing them for what was coming, even though they didn't realize it. He was preparing them for the fact that they were able to, needing to be able to carry out the mission of God, which is what? The people of God on the mission of God for the glory of God, sharing the gospel. He wanted them to establish the church, the church as a body. In fact, when you look through Scripture, the church is referred to in three main ways. It's referred to as the body of Christ. It's referred to as the bride of Christ. And it's referred to as the people of God. It's never referred to as four wall buildings. It just doesn't exist. It's a building that facilitates. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Let me pause right there for just a second. Who do, you, who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Answer that question in your mind. Who do you say the Son of Man is? Who is he? Who is he to you? They replied, some people say that John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now there are a lot of different views represented in this passage of who Jesus is. And today, a lot of people have a lot of different views on who Jesus is. Some will say he's an individual, he's a good teacher, but not necessarily the Messiah. Some will say he's the Messiah and we should have a relationship with him and he provides the salvation, the doorway to salvation, but at the same time, I really don't need to worship him because he's not God. Some people say he's Jesus, he's God, he's the Holy Spirit, it's the Trinity, it's part of that. There's a lot of different views there's a lot of different people that are misrepresenting who Jesus is to the world, and that is why a lot of people don't go to church. They don't go to the church because of the people in the church. And when the people in the church are misrepresenting who God is, and they take their focus off of him, the world slips away. We focus on the four walls. We focus on the things contained within. To a point, like I said, there's been tension. There's been church splits throughout history over, and to put it bluntly, stupid things. Things that really don't matter when it comes down to it. Now, I'm not saying that they're not valued in some fashion, and I'm not saying we can't have our preferences, and I'm not saying that there's not reasons behind the reason why we like certain things. There's a hundred different reasons why we like the music styles we do. There's a hundred different reasons why we're comfortable with certain aspects of the building. 
Some of it's because that's what we grew up with. Some of it's because we had our most powerful come to Jesus moments surrounded by some aspect of that. And so we're comfortable with that. We know that. But that's not where our focus needs to be. Our focus has got to be on God. Our focus on God has got to outshine everything else. Because if it doesn't, we don't, we don't have a motivation to go. We don't have a motivation to serve. We don't have a motivation to worship him. Now, Peter does what many of us would say gave a churchy answer. Because all the disciples are saying, well, people say this, people say that, people say this. And Jesus says, well, who do you say? Oh, well, yeah, you're the son of man. You're, you're, you're the Messiah. That's a church Sunday school answer. But it's accurate. And Peter saw something. He understood that a relationship with God is more important than anything else. He understood that nothing was more powerful than God. He understood that nothing carried more weight than God. He understood that there was significance there. Continue down in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. We're gonna see how Jesus responds to this revelation. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood didn't reveal it. It comes from having an intimate relationship with the Father. It comes from having the revelation. It comes from studying his word. It comes from listening. It comes from spending time. It comes from serving. It comes from all these things that we start to realize who Jesus is and our worship for him. Remember last week I said that worship is praising God for what God does, what, who he is. There are essentially three main ideas that come out of this passage right here in Matthew. Number one, the church is built by Jesus. The church is built by Jesus. I was reading an article recently in which it said that a high percentage of people in our world today go to church, but they've forgotten the reason why they were there. They go because it's a social club. They go because their friends are there. They go because they like a particular person or they like a particular music style, and so that's why they go. And they have forgotten the sole reason why they're there. That's why I ask, why are you here this morning? What is it that brought you here? It's a freezing cold day outside. But you got up, you got dressed. You bundled up and you got out of the house and you came to First Baptist. Why? What was your motivation? Week after week, we attend worship services. Week after week, people in our world, Christians, will go to churches and they will attend worship services, sitting in a special room or in a special building sometimes. And we have a word for that, sanctuary. Sometimes it's chapel. Sometimes it's temple. Whatever it is, there's a special word that people use but they give a little thought to why they're there. Scripture tells us that the church is the bride of Christ, and it was built to affirm and glorify the non-negotiable, essential elements of who God is. And we've talked about those over the last few weeks. And they can be summed up in four titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. Those aren't just words that we've said. Those aren't words that we sing. Those aren't words that we experience during one time of the year. Why are we asked questions throughout scripture? Why is it okay to question? We're using the wisdom that God has given us to be able to analyze things for ourselves. 
Number two, it is built through people. It is built through people. The church is a spiritual family. It's a group of believers coming together to hold each other accountable, to lift up our voices to God. It's a spiritual family that is coming together, doing something that many of you have heard me say over and over again, doing life together. It's a spiritual family who does life together. Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not neglect to gather to come together as some people are in the habit of doing, but encouraging others. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This being said, there's something that we gotta be careful of. Remember I said a lot of people go to church. A lot of people go to the church building. A lot of people are members of a church because it's a social club for them. We have to be careful. We have to be on guard on that because it's very easy to slip into that. It's very easy to say I'm going there not because I feel connected to the Spirit, not because I feel God speaking to me, not because of any of that, but because that's where my friends are. Now, is it good to have friends? Absolutely. Is it good to invite your friends to come? Absolutely. Is it good to go because a friend has invited you? Absolutely. But what happens when the time comes that that friend's not there? And let's face it, in our life today, we all know one thing that is absolutely certain. There is no denying whatsoever. Every single one of us at some point in our life are going to die. That's absolutely 100% certain. So what happens when your friend passes and you were going to a church solely for them? You're not connected. Your reason for going has vanished. But if you go because you're focused on God and you're focused on relationship with him and you feel like God has brought you there and has connected you there and you're attending week after week to worship him and praise him and you're involved in the church itself, when our friend passes, we go, you know what? I know where they're at. They're in a great place. I miss them. I love them. But that doesn't affect my relationship with that church body. The people, we're the called out assembly of God. We're the ecclesia who are tasked with showing compassion and mercy to others. That's our task, showing compassion and mercy to others by following the example of Christ to express love no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. And let's face it, we are going to find ourselves in struggles. We're going to find ourselves in temptations. We're going to find ourselves in hard times. It's life. But if our focus is on God and not any of the stuff here, then those, we're going to overpower that because we've got God working in us. Peter made his confession, and Jesus made it clear that he would build his church through his people. He didn't say anything about a building. He didn't say anything about brick and mortar. He said, I'm going to build my church on this rock. Jesus is talking about the people of God being sent out on the mission of God for the glory of God. As Christians, we have an incredible privilege to being part of something that is way bigger than we are. As followers of Christ, we are part of this global movement called the church, which has been going on long before we got here. And it's going to be going on long after we're gone. We are the body. We are the church. We are his hands and feet to the world. Jesus is building his church through his people. And when we accept a relationship with God, when we're brought into the fold, it's what Paul is talking about over in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. It says, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling 
in the Spirit. When we accept that relationship and we're brought into the fold, we're one. We're united. We're his children. The third point is it is built to last. The church is built to last. Jesus told Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He's explaining that when the church comes together, when the church is a unit, when the church is formed together through love and through grace and through mercy, when it comes together through a common bond with God, with the Father, there is nothing that's gonna tear it apart. There's no, not even the gates of Hades, not even the gates of hell are gonna break it apart because the church is connected. And when we're bound by our relationship with God, when we're bound by our love for God that flows into everything else, a couple of days ago on Friday, I put a little video out on Facebook in which I said, the love, what your, what your thought is on God and what your thought is on how you treat other people go a long way to answering the question on what you think of as church and what you think of as who Jesus is. We have to deal with struggles. It's life. We have to deal with setbacks. It's life. We're gonna deal with heartaches. We're gonna deal with heartbreaks. We're gonna deal with disappointments. Why? Because we're human. We're gonna disappoint each other. We're gonna let each other down. We're gonna be mad at each other from time to time, but we're a church family. God has built this family. And I don't know of a single family that's perfect. And I don't know of a single church that's perfect. And I guarantee you this, if you were to go to a church and find one that is perfect, please do not join it because you will ruin it. Because we are all sinners. We are all broken. Think about 20, sorry, you gotta think here, 2020. I almost said 2022. It hadn't even started, barely started. 2020. We had COVID hit. 2021, we had some more issues. What typically could have happened is the church could have been broken apart, but it didn't. A lot of churches went online, made an online presence like they never had before. We're one of them. What happened? The gospel spread even more. People that never heard the gospel were hearing the gospel. People that couldn't attend church because of physical limitations, we're attending church. My mother-in-law won't come sit in a church because of hurt that she experienced years ago. She watches online. The gospel spreads. The gospel will overpower everything. And the past two years have been a living example of that. Nothing is going to stop the church when it's bound together. Nothing is going to stop the church when it shares a common bond. I know of a couple that, from another church, that he attended weekly. She wasn't able to get out. When COVID hit and online became a presence, they got to worship for the first time in years as a husband and wife. That's powerful. That's God going, you know what? Let me do something here. There was a cartoon that came out during the COVID time frame when it was at its peak in which it showed the planet Earth and it showed Satan and God. And Satan said, hey, I broke up your churches. And God said, no, you didn't. You made them stronger. God isn't deterred by difficult circumstances. And there's nothing, nothing, not even the gates of Hades, that will stop the people of God being on the mission of God for the glory of God. Okay. We've talked about what church is. We've talked about what church isn't. And we've reiterated that a few times. So how do we respond? What do I do with this kind of information? How do I respond in my life to the fact that the church is the people? How do I respond to that? 
There's three simple ways. Number one, be in church. Be in church. Now that sounds really basic and really simple. But it's, the one piece, it's one of the pieces that we miss a lot. Now I understand that there are times where life gets busy. I understand that there are times where we're sick. I understand that there are times where we physically cannot move and get out and be in the church here in the building. I get that. What I'm talking about is when we have a busy schedule and we go, I don't have time to add something else. Something has got to give and we make church what gives. Don't let church be the thing that drops off. And when I'm talking about church there, I'm talking about coming together with the church body. Don't let being here on a Sunday morning be what drops off of your list of to do for the week. Be in the church. And if you can't be physically here, we understand that. But if you can, you need to be. God's called this body together to be here to support each other, to help us go through trials. One of the things that drives me nuts is when you hear somebody say, I can't go to church because I can't be around crowds. Okay, then don't go to a restaurant. Don't go to the supermarket. Don't go to a concert. Because I guarantee you, you got a bigger crowd. But they do. They go to those things, but they won't go to church because they don't want to be around a crowd. Church gets a back seat. Don't let that be the case. You want to know how to apply all this? Be in church. We have an incredible privilege, and there are people in our world today that are facing persecution, and they're having to hide the fact that they are part of a church body, that they are Christians, and they're having to do it in secret. We don't face that. Do we face persecution? Absolutely. The church is under a lot of fire right now. And it's mainly because of the way that church is represented. Oftentimes, we are known more for what we're against than what we're for. So number two, be for the church. Be for church. Think about that. Oftentimes, people will know what we are against, what we find is dis disrupting, what we find is negative, what we find that we're judgmental against, what we find that we don't like, they know that faster than they know who we are and what we value the most. You look at Christians in our world today, you can list off a hundred different things. How many people can look at you and go, you know what, above everything else, I know you're for God. I know God is the most important thing in your life. How many of you that are either watching online or sitting in here, when people look at your life, they can go, I know that God is the most important thing in your life. I hope that's the answer for everybody. But I know reality tells me it's not. We drive down the road. Somebody cuts us off. We get angry. Some of the worst road rage out there are people that others see in church on Sunday morning. And they think, this is what's represented? And this is why? And this is part of what makes it come across as negative, come across as hypocritical, come across as negative, uh, judgmental. Before the church, my challenge for 2022 for all of us is that we would be for the church. And how do you do that? You do that by showing up. You do that by serving. You do that by giving your time. You do that by giving your tithe. It takes money to make the world go round. We all know that. But yet, when you look at our, where our money goes, oftentimes, church gets the last end. And if we don't have enough to make it, we, you know, we ain't gonna do that. Mm, that should be over here at the front end. God deserves the best, and he deserves the first, not the last. We give our time, we give our tithe, our financial resources. We show up, we serve, 
We've got so many areas in our church, so many ministries, so many mission opportunities, but we need people. We need bodies. We need people involved. We want to grow. We want to grow our church family. Got to have people involved to do these things, and it brings people in. So 2022, I'm excited about because I know we, God's got some great plans, and there's a lot of things that are going to be unfolding and it'll take us some weeks to go through it. But we're gonna start with the book of Acts next week. Another way that you can be for the church is you pray for the people of the church body. You pray for the staff. You pray for the ministry areas. You pray for the people coming. As a matter of fact, you pray for anybody and everybody that walks through the doors. You pray for our community. Let's spend 2022 as a year where people can go, you know what, the church body over there at First Baptist Church, they're in the church and they're for the church. They care about us, they love us. One of the perceptions that we've gotta change and people in Gatesville, if you've been around here a long time, you know what I'm talking about. The perception is that we're not that kind of a church. But if you're in here, you know that we are. Let's make, them, make it known out there that we are that kind of a church. And we do that by being the church. By being the church. Remember, church is not a building. It's not a worship style. <clears throat> it's the body of people. It's not even a ministry area. And I want you to repeat this after me. You've heard me say it a few times. The church, go ahead, the church, uh, y'all can do better than that. The church, the church. are the people of God, the God. on the mission of God, mission of God. For, the of God. for the glory of God. I say it one more time. The church, the church. are the people of God, the God. living the mission of God, mission. for the glory of God. If you are a follower of Christ, you belong to the church. You are the church body, and you are wherever you go. It doesn't matter if it's here. It doesn't matter if it's at work. It doesn't matter if you're pumping gas. It doesn't matter if you're at the grocery store. It does not matter. You are the church. We are the church, and we do that by praying for people. We do that by engaging in the lives of people. We do that by sharing the gospel. We do that by meeting the needs of individuals that we come across, that we see. We do it by being here, by saying, you know what, I'm struggling in this. We're broken. This is not a place where everybody's perfect, even though sometimes we want to act like we are. We're not perfect. We're broken. And it's time to be able to say, hey, I'm hurting. I need help. And we have our church body come together. Wouldn't that be awesome to be able to go, I've got an issue, I've got a struggle, I've got a temptation, and have a church family come alongside you? That'd be so cool. We all want that. We share the gospel. City on a hill is not hidden. It's not. The light for Jesus Christ needs to be pointing away to him. We are the salt, we are the light. We're called on mission, and we need to be pointing to him. Who is Jesus? God. Who's God? It's the most powerful thing, the most wonderful thing, the most loving in our lives. The gospel, God, our sins, paying everyone life. Done. It's gospel. And we are called to share that. Who is the church? What is the church? Why does the church exist to glorify God? to glorify him. What's our motivation for walking through those doors? To grow stronger together and stronger with God. That's what it should be. That's what it means to be the church. That's what it means. Starting next week, like I said, we're gonna dive off into the book of Acts. We're gonna see how God is calling us to be the church. 
And every week, for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be sharing a piece of the vision for First Baptist. So you don't want to miss, because you'll miss something very important. But you want to see what this is like? You want to see how this lives out in a real life situation? For that, we got a testimony we're going to share. Now, unfortunately, the person whose testimony we're talking about can't be with us. Basically, because they don't live right here. But I'm going to ask Diana Fincher to come up, and she's going to tell us a little bit about these individuals and what the power of prayer, what the power of love, what the power of serving, what the power of being the church can do in somebody's life. So, um, I am here to um, present a praise and to glorify the Father in something that we all, that many of us participated in a couple of years ago. I'm the I'm the coordinator for the North Fort Hood Ministry, and I need to say that ex except for our, our online folks, and. Um, and so, as North Fort Hood Ministry, we minister to the military, and, um, and we do that, you know, cooking, making cookies, and being present in, when at their functions, bringing them into our community, uh, decorating their chapel, simple things like that. We think of those things, but there are some vitally important spiritual missions that we provide for them. You know, you're talking about the church. Uh, the church is a structure, and the structure is our physical structure, but we are the, the church is the, also the spiritual force within that structure. And as First Baptist Church, you are the spiritual force within this structure. And so, and then our community of faith, our faith community of other structures. Um, all right, what I'm talking about, Sarah, there is a, there are some photos, but you do the first one, I think it's a military. Okay, I would like to introduce you to Major General, retired, Frank Tate and his wife Beverly, and that picture, that's what I got this Christmas from them in Hawaii. And look at those smiles, the joy, the joy on their faces. Um, in 2019, he was the first, he was the commander, general uh, commander of, of First Army Division West that runs North Fort Hood and many other brigades. But uh, he got here in the summer and the following in 2019 and by May of 2020, and we know what's going on in 2020, He's diagnosed with stage four <clears throat> brain cancer. That's, that's, what, that's him. And by the way, these two are newlyweds at this time. And they had neither one, they'd been career oriented and neither one had married, had children. So the pictures that you see are, this is, I put out to the North Fort Hood Ministry and to First Baptist Church, we had, um, we had a prayer team that was very active. We prayed during, for the whole service, every worship service, we, as we had uh, folks that would go and, and pray uh, for the whole time, according to a list. Well, the Tates were, were on this list, and, uh, and so we continued to pray. And so the picture in the, so uh, the, the next picture is um, him in his uniform, and so we kind of got him in reverse, but... I want to read. Um, I want to read a very important scripture when it comes to prayer and our purpose. We are the spiritual force. We have Holy Spirit within us, and this is our. And so, I'd like to read John nine, one through twelve. This is the healing of the blind man, and uh, it's very powerful when we pray for someone, or we ourselves have a need for prayer, I feel like this is Jesus telling us why things happen. As he went along, he saw a man, this is Jesus, 
he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. Then he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Those are, that's a small portion of John 9, and it's the verses 1 through 12. It is one of my favorite ver, uh, passages in the Bible because it reminds me everything we do, we do for the Father who sends us. And we are that spiritual force, and we do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we are to pray and when and I come here tonight or today to give you faith in your prayers. That is that that is our purpose. That is our force is our prayers. So thank you North Fort Hood Ministry to our community when I send out this all call for the Tates. And by the way, this is a second healing of cancer for commanders that we have prayed for in 2014. Colonel Scott Coffin was diagnosed. He deployed out. He was uh, from a North um, National Guard in Oregon. He deployed out, and as soon as he got to his assignment, he became, he had like flu-like symptoms, and they discovered he had stage four lung cancer, had to come home. We prayed. That we were praying in 2014. Please continue to pray for our military and to have faith in your prayers, to offer up your prayers to others to, to, so that we can combine forces to, um, to uh, present the true church uh, of healing and mercy and compassion and kindness and, and uh, value to uh, all those and others. So um, I have so much I would love to say, but I know our time is short. And, and I hope that this has, has been an edification for you in your prayer life, that, the, that when you, the words you utter are received, they don't just vanish into the atmosphere, but they are received by the, our Father. They are our petitions are heard. Not always are we answered in the way we hope, but um, there is purpose. That This tells me, this story tells me there is purpose in someone being born blind. There is purpose in someone having cancer. And the ultimate purpose is to glorify he who does the healing or the uh, salvation of that person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, for coming to, to share that testimony. The power of prayer, the power of prayer, the power of love, the power of being God's people on mission does some wonderful things. If there's ever a doubt, take that story, take that testimony. Look at your own. Every single one of us are here because of something that somebody did, some love that somebody sent. Some love that somebody shared. 
I'm going to ask the, the team to come back up and close us in our next song as we can close our worship time together. God has sent us on mission. He has created the church. He's created a church family right here. The altar is open. We need prayer. This is the time. If you find yourself wanting to join this body of church believers, this body of Christ followers, I'm gonna invite you to step down and come and join me at the front. If you need prayer, come join me. Anything that you need. God is moving towards us today and he is calling us to be the church in a broken and hurting world. Let's band together and let's go on mission to glorify God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the way that you love us and the opportunities that you give us to be able to minister to your children. God, as we go into our world and we're faced with struggles and we're faced with temptations and we're faced with heartaches and we're faced with hurting people around us, God, help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to always remember that the church is us. We are the church. We are the church being sent out on mission. We are the church. We are your church that you have built. God, help us to always remember that and help us to be able to open up to our brothers and sisters in not only our struggles, but also in our celebrations. God, if there's anybody here this morning that needs prayer, I just pray that they come down Kneel at the altar and just lift that up to you, God. There's no shame in doing that. And God, if there's somebody who wants to join this body of believers that you have put together and be able to be a part of that and going out into this world, God, I, I just pray that you move in their hearts today to be able to come down and do that, to join this body, to be able to say, you know what, this is my church home. This is, this is where I belong. This is where you've called me to come, God. And I want to do that. I want to do that now. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of hesitating. And God, if there's anybody in here who does not have that relationship with you, whether they've got more questions or they're ready to make that commitment, God, just pray that they come down and be able to say, you know what? I'm tired of running. I'm tired of hiding. I feel God moving towards me and I'm ready. I'm ready to make that step. God, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that may
Uh, I'll tell you what, God has got some wonderful plans for First Baptist. He is taking us in some new and exciting ways, uh, and we have a family that said, hey, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of what God is doing here. So I'm going to invite them to come up and stand here with me. We have uh, Nathan and Cheryl Feinberg, uh, and their son Josh is going to come and you want to stand next to Dad? You want to stand, you want to stand right there? All right, there we go. He's like, Frick! Dad's over there. Uh, they have come saying that they want to be a part of our church family, and if you will affirm that with me as we welcome them uh, to the church body of First Baptist Church Gatesville. We are, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand up here for a little bit. The people will come by and say, hey, we're going to put you to work uh, and, and be a part of our family. Uh, great, loving family. I've got a chance to get to know them over the last little bit of time. Um, and trust me when I say that they're going to be a huge blessing to our church body right here. A um, couple of quick things I want to hit on before we leave. This coming Sunday, we've got the men's ministry kicking off Sunday night, 6 o'clock. All you guys, you are welcome to come. It's for 13 and up. Uh, it's going to be over in the Fellowship Hall. We get to start with a meal and start our Bible study on what is it, wh who are we as scripturally, biblically called to be as men, not only in the church, but also in our families and in our world. So that kicks off this Sunday night. Talking about Sunday, we have a wonderful thing happening. We have uh, Matt, our new youth minister, is coming. He will be here this coming Sunday. He'll actually be here this week. He got settled in, uh, and he's moving in to his new place here in Gatesville tomorrow. Uh, so we're excited to have him with us and joining us. Uh, and we are going to have a little reception for him following service next Sunday. Uh, so details are going to be coming a little bit, but uh, we will have a little reception, a little meet and greet to where we can say, hey, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. I know he is very excited. Uh, he has been looking for an opportunity to serve in a rural setting, and I think we'll all agree that Gatesville is a rural setting. So it's a place where God is really calling him to be, uh, and I know he's going to make a great addition to our staff and to our church. Uh, so be here next Sunday as we, as we welcome him. We've got the Bible study. We've got a few other things listed in the bulletin. And like I said, next week we dive off into Acts chapter 1. What a wonderful book to go through. And we'll be in it for several weeks to come. Y'all have a blessed week. I'll see you next time.